Hi, I'm Maria Theoharis or Velo Sews on social media. Welcome back to Server 50 Podcast on Soul Organized Style. Grab a cuppa and relax with us. On Soul Organized Style Podcast, I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we record this podcast and pay respects to the elders past and present. Thanks for joining us on Sober 50 Podcast on Soul Organized Style. Sober 50 intersects with all communities. We're a community that is so over ageism. Today's guest is Morag, or on Instagram, you know her as Morag underscore CJ. She's today's Sober 50 guest, and I'm really pleased that she's here because Morag also gave me a bit of a one-day tour of Glasgow, and it was wonderful. So thank you for being on the podcast too. I'm, I'm so honoured to be here, Maria. I just, oh, it's just amazing. I love the day in Glasgow with you and getting to know you a bit. And yeah, thank you for asking me. No, that's okay. Part of that going around Glasgow, I was really pleased that you showed me where you learnt your profession. Yeah. Because that was quite unique, that whole area. So much history in Glasgow and you're part of that history. Yeah, I mean, I don't feel as if I come from Glasgow because I've, I've never actually lived inside Glasgow City, but right. certainly at university and doing my medical degree, I suppose I was in and around the hospitals. So my roots in Glasgow are limited <laughs> to getting from one hospital to another, especially on the south side. South of the river, it's a different country. But it was nice. We had great weather. It was. We did like 20,000 steps that day easy. I can't believe how many we did. We just talked and walked and <laughs> it just disappeared yeah it was good that we also met at Sober 50 Frocktails too that was yeah that was amazing yeah mm. I mean I was looking forward to it but I was also a bit nervous because I had never really met apart from Judith on occasion I'd never really met anyone at an event before I met some of the so Scottish girls a couple of weeks before that in Dunfermline so Lynn at Lynn Sows now yep and Sheila, Sheila still sporadically, and a couple of other people. But I hadn't met the majority of people before, and it was just incredible. And seeing people that you knew from little pictures, yeah, and then meeting them in real life, it was just incredible, just as if you'd always known them, or as if they were people from the television that you thought you knew. And But it was just so friendly, and everyone just chatted and got on with each other. It felt like a reunion. It did. Yeah. It did, yeah as if you had known everyone for a long time ago and then just got back together. Yeah, it was good. It was wonderful. And congratulations to Judith and Sandy for putting on such a great event and for getting us all together since 2018. Amazing. Yeah, just amazing. Now, about you, Morag, when did you start sewing? I can't actually remember not being able to sew, I don't think, or maybe at least not making things. I probably started sewing when I was about eight, we were making dirndl skirts at school, hand-sewn mm-hmm. dirndl skirts at school. And I'm sure mine was so grubby because it took me so long to sew one seam <laughs> up the middle of the back, <laughs> back stitch. I got fed up with it, but I knew I could do it. And the teacher apparently thought it was quite neat. But I used to make dresses for my dolls out of bits of toilet paper and, and then started cutting up fabric. So it was the sort of original zero waste patterns, piece of fabric, hole in the middle, we slipped mm. over their heads and that was it, <laughs> tie around the middle. Oh, wow. So it was toilet paper and that's it? That's what you started on? I started off with sheets of toilet paper and, you know, these tiny wee trolls with the long hair? Yeah. They were small enough to have a dress made out of a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to make quite a quite a big slit to get it over their heads and then, Tied it around the middle and my mum eventually said, look, just have some fabric. You can do it with my scraps. <laughs> That's good for your mum to at least yeah. have realised that you're going to keep doing this. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what she thought of the toilet paper, but it was quite funny at the time. <laughs> That's good. And then from there, did you end up sewing at school as well? I mean, you said that you did hand-sewn dirndl skirts. Yeah, we did handcrafts of some sort, Mm. a project every term, I suppose. But I think I only started using the sewing machine when I was about 10 or 11. Mum had a straight stitch machine and that was all she had. So she really showed me what to do with that. And then in secondary school, I think it was the end of first year, 
two of us from our year were put forward to make something for a sewing competition. Mm-hmm. So that was when I was probably about 12. And I made a pair of dungarees and a shirt with a huge collar and puffy sleeves. And I took everything home. And mum showed me how to use the straight stitch machine for making French seams and to finish the edges on the dungarees. And of course, when I took them back to school, the teacher thought that I had had help. And I had had help in the sense that she had shown me what to do, but she Mm. certainly didn't help me with the making. And so the head of department put forward the other girls' make for the competition. Oh, that's not fair. (laughs) It wasn't fair at all. I was very miffed. (laughs) Never mind. But obviously that didn't stop you from sewing, did it? No. I mean, at school, I think I only did sewing for two years. And what I learned from that was tailor tacking yeah. and things like that. So basic stuff, because mum didn't really show me how to do that. She showed me how to do the sewing, but she didn't really show me the basics of the pattern markings and the tailor tacking and the notches and all this kind of thing. And that was really useful. But I just loved it. And I'm quite small and I found it difficult to get clothes to fit, I suppose. And I really enjoyed having the freedom to sew. Mum used to give me bits of leftover fabric that she had to start with. And then I had a Saturday job as a waitress. So I used the money for that, for buying probably really cheap fabric and making things with really cheap fabric. But I really enjoyed it. And I don't think I've really stopped making since I've had periods that I haven't sewn a lot. But I've always made curtains and cushions and things for the kids. And yeah, I've always sewn. I'm glad that that competition didn't stop you from continuing to sew. I think I felt, I don't know, I felt that it was really unjust. And I loved those dungarees. I wore them to death. And I don't know what happened to them. I don't have a photograph. I think if there's a photograph in existence, it's probably at my dad's house. Mm. So I will have a look one day. I don't think he's going to give that photo up. No way. (laughs) (laughs) So you've learnt a lot of techniques only having a straight stitch machine. Has that affected how you've continued on with new technology? Well, mum got a zigzag machine, I suppose, when I was in my mid-teens and she gave me her straight stitch machine. So I carried on using the straight stitch machine and eventually got a machine of my own, I think just before I got married, which has been great. I'm on my second machine now, but the first one had an automatic button holder and zigzags and lots of other things, which was fantastic. And then for my 40th birthday, mum bought me an overlocker, which I was very excited about and took it home and decided I would try it out. And it chewed things up. I could not use it. I'm not very good at reading instructions, (laughs) which I think was a bit of a mistake at the beginning. And I think I may have probably misthreaded it anyway. Mum didn't ever know that I hadn't used it, really. Mm -hmm. And I just stuck it at the back of the cupboard and forgot about it because I was so cross with it, chewing things up. And then after I joined Instagram, I think probably my third or fourth post, I thought, you know, everyone's using overlockers these days. I really must get my overlocker out and have another look at it. And I couldn't find the instruction book at all. Hunted high and low for the instruction book. And so I put, I think probably my third or fourth post on Instagram was please somebody help me with this overlocker. Not really expecting much of a response because nobody knew who I was, nobody knew me. And I got the most amazing response. People from the So Over 50 community, people from So Scottish, somebody shared the post on their stories. More like looking for overlocker help, please can somebody help? Oh, wow. One of the girls from So Scottish directed me to Portia Laurie's post. She had some videos on Instagram or on YouTube, I think about how to use the overlocker. Trisha Morris at Morris Sews also helped. One of my friends who is an upholsterer at Upholstery Jill, and I think it was uh, Christine at Seems Like Friday who had shared the post in her stories. And the response I got was phenomenal. And I just thought, this is such a lovely group, just so friendly and warm. And and eventually I did actually find the instruction book after a bit of a struggle, but I think it was just the help I got and the fact that it was so positive and I was feeling kind of a bit positive at the time and I got it working and I've been using it ever since. So Thanks to everyone who chipped in and helped you find videos and all the resources you needed to take that step. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was amazing. Because you've got a straight stitch background, you're very accurate and that also is reflected in sewing that you do for your family. Yeah, I suppose that's probably true. Um, yeah. Yeah, having you had to use the straight stitch machine, mm. top stitching and things. I really enjoy doing that. And I really enjoy making things that are slightly different and quirky as well. 
I suppose that's the benefit of sewing, isn't it? People, you can make things that, that nobody else has are slightly different from the norm. So you do sewing for yourself and you do sewing for your family. So what does that usually entail? Well, since my family consists of all boys, <laughs> I've got four <laughs> boys and my husband. I've also got a daughter-in-law and the boys have got girlfriends as well. But my family basically consists of boys. So while they were growing up, I made things like shorts and little shirts. But I think also because of the straight stitch machine, I wasn't really keen on using jersey. So I didn't really get into using jersey until much later. So it was basically shirts and shorts and trousers. I made some trousers and a shirt for my husband early on. (laughs) But they were very pale and they were dirt magnets. So he stopped making them and I didn't make any more. (laughs) Because you've got five men to sew for, does that mean that shirts are one of the things that you're really good at yeah I like the process of shirt making I really enjoy shirt making Mm. I've used various patterns over the years I started off with the big four simplicity and these are the shirts that I sewed for my husband probably early on and then I discovered the thread theory Fairfield shirt a couple of years ago and it's such a good pattern I just love it to the point where you're very good at production selling it where I could sew it in my sleep I think (laughs) I can't remember how many I've made I started off making a 12 when I measured all the boys and Ian basically all kind of fitted into the same size right in terms of the measurements but they didn't I mean they don't look at all the same some are short some are tall some have got broader shoulders but according to the measurements they were all within the, the same size and I thought okay so I made a 12 of the medium and tried it on people and it kind of vaguely fitted most of them but they all needed tweaked so I ended up having to make five different patterns for five different people (laughs) so that was the first job but now I've got them and I've told them they are not to change size anymore (laughs) good (laughs) when you do make the shirts for all the men in the family do you individualize them I have done one so it took a long time Well, I was making one for my second eldest for his birthday. I can't remember when that was, maybe 2019. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I didn't know what I could do. I could, in fact, it was just after Mary Mary Thimble had done some jeans and she had uh, stitched some Lord of the Rings motifs on the the pockets at the back. Yeah. So I thought, oh, my boys are really into Lord of the Rings. And I thought I could stitch something on David's shirt. And... I said to him, oh, how do you fancy, I can't remember the name of it now, on the pocket of your shirt? And he looked at me and he went, mum, people would see it. And I said, well, I could do it in the same colour and it'd be kind of subtle. And he went, no. Mm. But I had got the idea in my head by then. Mm. And I thought, I know what I could do. I could put it on the inside of the yoke. So I got a contrasting colour for the yoke and stitched it was a star from Lord of the Rings on the yoke of the shirt, which you can see when it's hanging on its hanger, but you can't see when you're wearing it. So he actually really likes it, but I think he's quite pleased it's not in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's there, so I'm quite happy with that. But having done that, I then had to make shirts for the rest of them with motifs on the, the yokes as well. So did they get a say about what the motif was? I can't remember. Yes, I did ask them the rest of them, I think. Uh, In fact, the original motif I did on the back of David's shirt was called an even star from Lord of the Rings. And then the other four were the eyes of Toothless the dragon. The one I did for my husband was a train. It was a a steam engine called Maud, which lives in Bowness near Edinburgh. He's into trains. One of them was the Cosmere symbol. I don't know anything about this at all, but I've been told it's from the Brandon Sanderson books. Hmm. I don't know what that is. And the other one, one of my boys is a very keen climber. So I did an outline of the Coolin Hills on the horizon. So it was the Coolin Hills in the sky on one of them. The Cosmere symbol on one, the train on one, Toothless on one, and the Even Star on one. And they took ages. But they can all see that embroidery when their shirt is hanging in the cupboard. They can, yeah. And I know it's there. And I actually really enjoyed doing them and working out how to do them. But I think I said on my Instagram post, it was a bit like, do you remember the beetle game where you have to throw a six to get the body to start? Mm -hmm. The the drawing beetle game. And I felt like these yokes were my beetles, the the number six 
dice that you had to throw before you could do anything else. And it wouldn't keep coming up. Well, that's right. So I, I kept having to throw all the sixes. And then by the time I had embroidered all the yokes, all the rest of the shirt came together because the yoke is the central part of the shirt that everything joins into. Wow. Yeah. All of those shirts have got plackets. They have. You must be able to do that in your sleep now. I think I'm quite good at it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I think it's difficult with thicker fabric, but I've worked out a way of, of doing the end of the placket, which is a bit easier. Okay. I'll have to give you a shout out when that happens for me. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not to do it anytime too soon. All right. And I've actually seen them being worn as well for various things. Unexpectedly, Scott, my eldest son, plays in a band. So he wore his shirt for playing in a gig. The second eldest sings in a choir and he had his own for one of the choir concerts. So they, they do get worn. I'm very pleased to see. Good. And so what have you got on your sewing table now? Well, it's really a cutting out table at the moment. There's a, oh, it's a surplus fabric, a waste fabric warehouse in Glasgow called Nomad underscore SLT. And they rescue cashmere waste and other woolen waste. It's gorgeous. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. They had an open weekend, the weekend after Frock Tales. So I think a couple of days after you were here, they had an open weekend. And we were going on holiday the next day, but I was absolutely determined to go. So we went in, my husband took me in, and I found a couple of pieces of beautiful cashmere waste. They're not very big, but I thought, oh, wonder if I could make a... And I was thinking zero waste bob coat kind of idea for one of them, and a kind of warm tank toppy thing from another one. A layer. A layer. So I have been playing with paper this week, cutting out bits of paper and trying to make the size of the fabric work into something that I can sew up later. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Oh, I'm going to look forward to seeing how that turns out on Instagram. Thank you. So am I. <laughs> no, I'm enjoying the process of the paper pattern, but I'm terrified to cut into the fabric because once you cut, that's it. So it has to be right. The paper has to be right before I start cutting. But yeah, I'll get there. Well, I'm sure that with your history of using paper to work out clothing and patterns, you'll be spot on. <laughs> I didn't think of that. <laughs> That's funny. I'm really pleased that you've been able to rescue some of that cashmere fabric so that you can make it into something for yourself that you'll really love. Yeah, I'm really pleased as well. I feel an obligation that I've got it not to waste a scrap. So that's why I'm trying to figure out a way of using everything. So fingers crossed. Oh, you've got the weather to be able to wear it for more than six weeks that we have here. This is true. Yes. <laughs> Although it'd probably be worth it for six weeks. Oh, yeah, of course it would be. Because you've got a good background in shirt making and there might be some listeners who are starting to think about making shirts with lots of detailing. What advice would you give them? Well, I actually found the Thread Theory shirt pattern to be really, really good, really helpful. It explains everything. They've also got a series of videos on how to do it. I looked them up for alterations of the pattern or fitting just for some fitting advice on, on how to alter the pattern. And I found them really useful. So I think that's a good starting point. I mean, it's, it's a relatively complicated shirt, I suppose, for someone who's just starting. But the additional resources which are online, which go with it, are brilliant. I suppose the other one would be to make a shirt that doesn't have a collar stand and packets to start with. So just make a shirt which has short sleeves and a casual collar might be an idea as well. Well, that's good advice. We've had Adriana on the podcast for Thread Theory, I think last year when we did the Sewing for Men series. Mm -hmm. So I know that she'll be thrilled to hear that you've gotten a lot of use out of that Thread Theory pattern for all the men in your family. Yeah. I certainly have. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. And I think we'll continue to be used. Good. And as you said, they all fit into the medium size, but you know what the tweaks are for each body that you're sewing yeah. for. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if I tried to make a bigger or a smaller size to fit the other bits, if that makes sense, mm. to fit the bits that didn't fit the original, I think it would have been far more difficult to do the alterations. So I'm glad I stuck with the original measurements and then did the tweaks on that first pattern. Great. Well, Rick, thank you for coming onto the podcast for Cyber 50 and for talking about all the help that you've received from people in the community, not just from Cyber 50, but also in So Scottish as well. Yep, indeed. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been lovely to see you, 
really happy to see you again, Maria. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for the day in Glasgow. So pleased to have met you. And again, thank you for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for asking me. It was lovely. Thanks. Cool. Good to see you. Thank you so much. This episode of Pulse Over 50 podcast on Soul Organized Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Morag, sound by bensound.com. Listeners, if you want to provide a guest post for Sober 50, make sure you direct message Judith and Sandy at the Sober 50 account on Instagram. Also, keep an eye out for the next So 50 Live event that Bird and Molly are hosting. Remember, these Sober 50 Live events will always be available on the Sober 50 account. You can subscribe to Soul Good Night Style Podcast, but with an S not a Z on all good podcast apps. Make sure you go back and listen to our free So Over 50 Podcast archive. And if you can, consider supporting the production of this podcast on Patreon so I can keep producing it for you. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.